Well, let's get started. Um, Jeff asked me to teach this month, so I am going to try to teach, and uh, we'll open with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give our thanks to you for your goodness to us and for especially your grace that we will be uh, studying. I pray that you will uh, guide our discussion and uh, lead us into truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jeff told me I could uh, discuss anything we want. So I, I want to talk this month about um, the so-called five points of Calvinism, which I insist on the so-called there because uh, five points of Calvinism implies that this is a summary of Calvin's teaching, which it is not. And so I'm not going to use that term. I may use the term doctrines of grace or something. That's kind of a technical term that, that means the same thing but doesn't have the, the drawback of uh, f implying something that it's not. So that's, that's what we'll talk about. It's something we don't necessarily hear a lot about in, at Park Woods. And um, there's good reasons for that because it, in fact, um, in spite of maybe the popular perception is not really the sum and substance of, of uh, Reformed teaching. There's a lot, you know, if, if I talk about uh, Kingdom of God or Covenant or um, Reformed worship under the regulatory principle, none of those really even touches on these five points and so there's just all kinds of things that, that go beyond that. Nor do the solas of the Reformation uh, find themselves in that, although they are in many ways closely related. So this is not the five points that summarize all of Reformed teaching. It is not the reason for the Reformation. <coughs> this is really not the center of what the Protestant Reformers uh, had as their dispute with the Catholic Church. There are, in fact, many points of agreement with Catholicism um, in these. There are also disagreements, but that really wasn't what the Reformers were focused on. Um, but it's ne nevertheless something that Presbyterians should be conversant with, and so I want to talk about that in the next few weeks. Um, The five points are often thought of as reformed distinctives. I'm even going to argue that they're really not that distinctive. Um, a strong view of, of God's sovereignty is historically is consistent with the historic position of the church. Uh, back to Augustine um, and, and others, we'll, we'll see that this is really not outside of the mainstream of uh, the Catholic Church teaching historically and it's it's really not outside of the mainstream of um, ref of uh, Protestant teaching either there's really a lot of agreement amongst historic Protestant thought as as to adopting a, a strong view of God's sovereignty so it's not the seventh substance of Reformed teaching. It's really not that distinctive, um, and it, but it's something that we should have at least a conversant understanding of. Um, I do not intend to go into a lot of proof texts or or arguments about why we're right and they're wrong. There's um, plenty of that out there uh, that's been discussed for the last 400 years thoroughly and I, I don't really have a lot to add to why we're right and they're wrong. I don't want to make that the focus of it. I'd rather talk about uh, what these doctrines are, uh, understand the Reformed position, understand the Arminian position as well. Um, and w one of the things I do want to talk about more than um, you know, here's what the Bible says and why this is the right interpretation. I want to talk about why we should care about these doctrines. In some ways, these are academic doctrines that professors debate about and, and they get in their fine points and, and have everything worked out systematically. 
Is that something that every Presbyterian layman needs to know? Probably not, but there are reasons why these doctrines do matter to us and I want to talk about that more than why why we're right and, and they're wrong. Um, one aspect of the debate between Reformed and Arminians is that the Arminian position really is, is attractive in the sense that I, I think most people uh, just given a choice of what would you like to believe, would like to think of God as fair, treating everyone fairly, equally. You know, we have the idea that God is just, but that's not necessarily the same as the more subjective concept of fairness. And, and so the Arminian doctrine is attractive to people on that basis. Um, if you hear two people debating and one says this is what the Bible teaches and the other says you know I can't believe in a God like that it's likely that the one saying this is what the Bible teaches is reformed and the one that says I can't believe in a God like that is Arminian I don't want to overgeneralize and I, I um, because there are Arminians who are serious Bible students who develop, you know, uh, the doctrines from the Bible, but there's this tendency to say, you know, that Reformed God just doesn't appeal to me. And um, I want to take that seriously and say, why, why would we want to believe these five points? Not why must we, because this is what the Bible teaches, but why would anybody want to believe that? So I'll, I, I will talk about that probably later on, but uh, there are some aspects of these doctrines that, that make them something we really ought to um, appreciate and love, not just believe because this is what the Bible says. So we'll, we'll go into that as, as, uh, some. Um, so just a brief overview, I want to talk about what are these five points briefly, what is the history behind them, and uh, then we'll get into some other things. Um, probably most of you are familiar with the acronym TULIP, Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, perseverance of the saints. Total depravity um, can be summarized as um, we as fallen people, as descendants of Adam, have a inherited a corruption of nature that invades every part of our person and leaves us unable to do anything to contribute anything toward our salvation I think would be a succinct way to put that. Unconditional election is um, God has predestined certain people to be redeemed out of mankind and uh, put into place the, the process that will bring about that redemption and that election of those who will be saved is not based on anything that God sees in a person as opposed to what he sees in another person. And so this kind of follows from total depravity. If I'm so depraved that I am unable to contribute any merit or anything to my salvation, then I have nothing to offer when God is making up his list of who's elect, who's not. I have nothing to offer that says put me on that list because I can't contribute anything to my salvation. And so that one kind of leads to the other. Um, limited atonement is generally the doctrine that Christ's death paid, the, uh, paid for the sins of his elect and only for those sins. Um, it fits with the others because God's election is not based on anything he sees in us and so 
um, it, it, it just fits in with the rest of these. And we'll talk, that's probably the one that people stumble on the most, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, irresistible grace is the doctrine that when God elects and chooses for salvation, he gives the grace that will bring about the conversion of that person and it will always be effective in bringing about the conversion of those whom he has elected. So if, if God has elected someone, he gives his grace, there is no idea that that person may resist God's grace and therefore not finally be saved. Consistent with that, uh, perseverance of the saints is that the doctrine that those whom God has elected will not only accept his grace, put their faith in Christ, but they will continue to persevere. We have any number of scriptures that teach that um, there needs to be a, you need to stay in the faith to ultimately be saved and, and the Reformed view on that is that doesn't mean that some people will be saved and lose their salvation. It means that those whom God has elected by His grace will persevere to the end. So that's very briefly what these five points are. Um, the history of this, they come from the church in the Netherlands in um, early part of the 17th century. The Netherlands uh, at that point was a reformed church. They were under the Belgic Confession and we'll talk about that confession. But there was within the um, church at that time certain people who um, found these doctrines and they, they weren't new. They, they were part of the Belgic Confession, basically, uh, maybe not spelled out in as much detail. But they found these doctrines to be um, offensive or, uh, in their view, unbiblical, specifically Jacob Arminius. And I think he's called Jacob, Jacobus, James, I think all of those. And, and he, Arminius is a Latinized name. It was popular in... 16th and 17th centuries for um, theologians to adopt uh, Latin names. So that was where that <coughs> came from. But Arminius was a minister and I believe a professor uh, at a, in a university in the Netherlands. And he led a band of other like-minded people who began to protest against some of these doctrines and they uh, developed a uh, document called the Remonstrance, which was actually published after the death of Arminius himself, but it was he was the leader of the, the, this group, and they published this 1609, 1610, I don't remember, somewhere in there, and uh, this was their statement, and that's where five points started. They had five points in their Remonstrance that said this is what we believe um, in a opposition to orthodox reformed teaching at that time. And so the Church of the Netherlands um, put together a synod. I, don't, I think it took like 10 years before that synod actually met and I believe they had people attending not only from the Netherlands but from outside as well from other reformed countries. So it was, it was kind of a big deal. They put together this synod to address these concerns. And from that synod of Dort, it's um, Dort or Dordrecht, I, I, uh, I, I don't know why it's sometimes called Dordrecht, sometimes Dort, uh, usually it goes by the short name of Dort. The synod of Dort published five canons of Dort is what they're called. And so Again, the five points started with the Remonstrance. The Synod published five points to refute these. And so when we talk about five points, the, the canons of Dort are really the reference that we'll go to to say what are those five points. That's the, so if I want to say Tulip has this thing called irresistible grace, if I want to claim maybe that's not the best name for it, the authority for that will be what does the canons of Dort really say 
is that it, and so TULIP is supposedly a, um, a summary of those five canons, but we'll look at the five canons and, and that's really what the, the uh, source for this is, not the clever acronym that, um, um, of course, TULIPs come from Holland, the five points came from Holland, so it's kind of a nifty memory aid and nothing wrong with that. I guess uh, acrostics go back to the Psalms as a way to remember things, so it's, it's a useful tool in that sense, but it may also bring some distortion to these uh, five points. So I want to talk first of all, I'm claiming that um, a strong view, and let me say I'm, I'm talking about these five points um, present a strong view of God's sovereignty. And I say a strong view because if you ask an Arminian or almost any Christian, is God sovereign, the answer will be yes. And I don't want to cast aspersions on that because they are sincere in saying, yes, God is sovereign. But an Arminian would say, God is sovereign, yet he limits his sovereignty in these areas so that man has a free will to operate that is somehow apart from God's sovereignty. And so while they will say God is sovereign and I acknowledge that um, there's a large difference between one view of sovereignty and another. So I'm using strong view of God's sovereignty to say this is what the Reformed teaching is, not intending by saying strong to say that the other view, since it's weak, is, I'm not using that pejoratively. I really want to maintain a uh, respectful, irenic spirit in this class. Quite different, by the way, from uh, the way these discussions were conducted in the 16th and 17th century. Uh, as I, I realized uh, in reading some of this stuff that um, the condition we find our country in today where we see ourselves as highly polarized which you know those of us more than 50 years old can remember a time when that wasn't the case in our country it's not really a historical anomaly the 16th and 17th centuries nobody said anything nice about anybody that disagreed with him. It, it, you know, so th this was a very polarized debate, debate from the beginning and um, I, I'll try to conduct it in a different spirit than that, um, showing respect to those who disagree with us and you know if we have any secret Arminians in here you'll probably still be an Arminian because at the end of this class because as I said uh, my point is not to uh, develop all the proof texts and refute every argument that's been done enough times that I don't have anything to add to that. Um, but I, I, I want to make the point that this is really not at all unique to the Reformed churches and, and historically a strong view of God's sovereignty aligns very well with, with um, historic Christian faith. Um, so I want to start with Augustine and, and, and present some quotes from him. Uh, City of God, Book 14, Chapter 26, Augustine says that Almighty God, the supreme and supremely good creator of all natures, who aids and rewards good wills while he abandons and condemns the bad and rules both, was not destitute of a plan by which he might people his city with the fixed number of, his, of citizens which his wisdom had foreordained even out of the condemned human race, discriminating them not now by merits, since the whole mass was condemned as it were in its infected root, but by grace. So Augustine, uh, what, fourth century is Augustine? Fourth and fifth. Um, is already saying God, in, God has foreordained specific people to be part of his city. This is in the book City of God. Um, 
the whole mass is condemned, but he discriminates them not by merits, but by <coughs> grace. So he's talking, you know, I, I don't want to say that Augustine agreed with these five points because that's anachronistic and it's unfair to judge someone who wrote 1500 years ago by the terms of the debate of the 16th and 17th century, but nevertheless he rejects the idea that God somehow saw something in this one and not in that one and therefore chose this one. He discriminates them only by grace. Um, John 6.44 is an important verse in these discussions. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Um, and so that would be a, you know, a, a, one of the proof texts that Reformed use and, and uh, Augustine on that, on a commentary on that verse says, no man comes unless drawn. There is whom he draws and there is whom he does, draws not. Why he draws one and draws not another. Do not desire to judge if thou desirest not to err. So um, Augustine says, we don't know why God draws one and not another, but he does not place it in any way in the idea that God must have foreseen or foreknew something in this one person and not the other, um, but simply says it's completely in the hands of uh, God's sovereign will. Um, Thomas Aquinas and Summa, Theo and, uh, Summa Theologiae uh, says God's will to manifest his goodness God wills to manifest his goodness in men in respect to those whom he predestines by means of his mercy in sparing them and in respect of others whom he reprobates by means of his justice in punishing them this is the reason why God elects some and rejects others Yet why he chooses some for glory and reprobates others has no reason except the divine will. So here uh, Thomas Aquinas is talking like a Presbyterian. Again, I don't want to put his uh, comments in t terms of our debates, but nevertheless he's exhibiting a very strong view of, of God's sovereignty. Um, and he quotes Augustine, he quotes what I just read. Why, here at Hans Augustine says, Why he draws one and another he draws not. Seek not to judge if thou dost not wish to err. So my point is not that Aquinas and Augustine were Presbyterians, but rather that a strong view of God's sovereignty where we simply say God elects one and not another and that reason is simply in the will of God and for nothing else. That, that strong view of God's sovereignty is very much consistent with historical Christianity. Now, um, you know, obviously Aquinas and Augustine are not scripture and there was in fact considerable debate over um, things that uh, uh, Augustine wrote on this topic. There, there were many people who did not necessarily agree with him. While we have councils where Augustine was approved and, and Pelagius condemned, it doesn't mean that the church councils approved everything that Augustine said. And so I, I'm not quoting Augustus or Aquinas to say this is the official position of the whole church throughout the ages, but I nevertheless want to say that this is not something the, the idea of a strong view of God's sovereignty was not something that popped up during the Reformation or at the Canon Synod of Dort. It has long and strong historic roots in the, in the church. Um, I want to go on to talk about other Protestant churches, but are there any comments or, or questions about the historic church? Yeah, Colby. I think that's, it's interesting and it just kind of occurred to me in this way for the first time, but 
it's it's interesting and I think important to note that the the uh, canons of Dort were a response to objections to the reform doctrine, just like Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings were a response to Pelagianism, right? And in some ways, you know, Paul's articulations of the doctrines of grace were a response to critics. And so I, I just think it's interesting that a lot of the most important <coughs> times that the doctrine of grace has been articulated have been not just times where somebody sat down and said, oh, hey, we need to do this, but they've been in response to something else. And I don't know, I don't know if that's significant at all, but it's at least interesting. Yeah. Anything else before we go on to the Reformation? So I, I've argued that the doctrines of grace, or, or more generally a strong view of God's sovereignty, is not is, is consistent with historic Christianity. I want to uh, show that uh, it's also um, consistent with the general uh, views of the Protestant Reformation, that, that the Reformed are not somehow unique among Protestants in, in believing uh, in predestination and these other things. So I, I want to start with uh, Lutherans. Um, the Augsburg Confession, which is 1530, an early confession, uh, Article 18 says, Concerning free will, they, meaning the churches, teach that man's will hath some liberty to work a civil righteousness and to choose such things as reason can reach unto, but that it hath no power to work the righteousness of God or a spiritual righteousness without the Spirit of God, because that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. But this is wrought in the heart when men do receive the Spirit of God through the Word. These things are in as many words affirmed by St. Augustine. Uh, we confess that there is all men a free will, quoting Augustine, which hath indeed the judgment of reason, not that it is thereby fitted without God either to begin or to perform anything in matters pertaining to God, but only in works belonging to this present life, whether they be good or evil. So, um, the, the Lutherans are confessing that, yes, there's a thing called free will, but it has no power um, to work the righteousness of God. So this is going back to, you know, total depravity. We, there's nothing in us that can work righteous apart from the Spirit of God, and our, our will is, is, as Luther wrote, uh, in bondage to sin. Um, the formula of Concord was a Lutheran document that um, sought to resolve some issues that had risen within the Lutheran Church in 1576. Um, and it goes into more detail about these things. Of free will, it says, yet the un the yet unregenerate will of man is not only averse from God, but hath become even hostile to God, so that it only wishes and desires those things and is delighted with them which are evil and opposite to the divine will. Therefore we believe that by how much it is impossible that a dead body should vivify itself and restore corporal life to itself, even so it is impossible that even so impossible is it that man who by reason of sin is spiritually dead should have any faculty of recalling himself into spiritual life. We repudiate the teaching that although ungenerate man in respect of free will is indeed before his regeneration too infirm to make a beginning of his own conversion and by his own powers to convert himself to God and obey the law of God, yet if the Holy Spirit by the preaching of the word shall have made a beginning and offered his grace in the word to man, then that, that then man by his own proper and natural powers can, as it were, give some assistance and cooperation, though it be but slight, uh, 
infirm and languid toward his conversion and can apply and prepare himself unto grace. For God in conversion of unwilling men makes willing men and dwells in the willing as Augustine is wont to speak. Let me say that again because that's kind of a long paragraph but, but they first say that the unregenerate man is averse from God and hostile to God so that his will is uh, opposite and evil to the divine will. And it is impossible that he should, um, as a dead body, should uh, restore itself to light. But they then go further and say, we repudiate the teaching that the unregenerate unre man uh, prior to regeneration can even make a beginning in, of his own conversion or that the whole that by the preaching of his word we reject the idea that a man who is unregenerate and sits under the preaching of the word can somehow make even a slight uh, movement toward his own conversion on his own powers and, and this is a um, will, will be a central aspect of our Arminian teaching. It's, it's not just Arminian, but goes back a thousand years before that as well. But the idea that um, yes, I'm I'm um, depraved. I have no ability to save myself, and yet there is some. Um, something in me that when I hear the preached word I can start to make an initiative toward God and that God will respond to that and and give me more grace so that I can finally be fully converted. That's that's what the uh, Lutherans here are specifically rejecting in this article and, and so there's this um, picture of a, a man who's drowning in a pool or a pond and um, the Arminians would like to say yes he's unable to save himself he's unable to swim to the edge and, and get out but God throws him a, a life buoy and or a, a life preserver on a rope and if he can just dog paddle over there and at least take the initiative to hang on to that life preserver God will then finish the job and pull him in. That's kind of a picture of Arminian teaching. Um, the reform teaching would say no there's this dead man on the bottom of the on the bottom of the pond. God brings this man to life then puts a life jacket on him and then hauls him in and, and that's kind of the picture of the difference between uh, the Arminian teaching, which will acknowledge depravity and acknowledge that a man is unable to save himself, and yet will try to find some way in which he can sort of grab that life preserver or take some initiative in, in himself. That's really what the Lutherans are rejecting here, is the idea that, yeah, I can reach out and at least make some initiative to say, I'm interested in this salvation. God, can you give me some more grace? Um, so the Lutherans are taking a very strong position in, in this formula of Concord saying, uh, no, we can't even make an initiative toward uh, saving ourselves. Um, again, formula of Concord, Article 11, of the eternal predestination and election of God. But the predestination or eternal election of God extends only to the good and beloved children of God and this is the cause of their salvation. We therefore reject that the mercy of God and the most holy merit of Christ is not the sole cause of the divine election. Let me read that again taking out the double negative. They say we reject that it is not. They are therefore saying the mercy of God and the most holy merit of Christ is the sole cause of divine election. And we reject that there is also some cause in us on account of which God has chosen us to eternal life. So, you know, this is a Lutheran document and yet it sounds very much like God just chose some to life and others not for we don't know why. Um, 
Luther wrote Bondage of the Will in 1525. Um, it was one of his favorite writings. If we believe it to be true that God foreknows and foreordains all things, that he can be neither deceived nor hindered in his prescience and how do you pronounce that? Pres prescience? Yeah. Um, and predestination that, and that nothing can take place but according to his will which reason herself is compelled to confess then even according to the testimony of reason herself there can be no free will in quotes in man in angel or in any critter um, did he say critter? yes he did <laughs> yes is the translation yeah. Yeah. He, 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 whatever the German for critter is. Right. I, I don't know if he was, he was probably writing in Latin, I think, yeah. actually. So. Um, so that's a Lutheran position. Now, I've cherry picked some things here. To say that Lutherans are, were, are or were wholly in agreement with, um, with, uh, reformed on these doctrines would absolutely be false. It would probably cause Luther to pound the table and say something in Latin. But uh, So I, I want to read one other thing. This is from something called Saxon Visitation Articles in 1592, which I'd never heard of before I started studying for this class. Um, and it was written to refute Crypto-Calvinism in the Lutheran Church in Saxony, wherever that is. Crypto-Calvinism means there were believed to be secret Calvinists in the Lutheran churches, and so they had to do something about this. So this was written um, specifically toward those people, uh, and these articles include Article 4 on predestination and eternal providence of God. One, that Christ died for all men and as the Lamb of God took away the sins of the whole world. So they are specifically uh, arguing against limited atonement. And two, that God created no man for condemnation but wills that all men should be saved and arrive at the knowledge of the truth. He therefore commands all to hear Christ his Son in the Gospel and promises by his hearing the virtue and operation of the Holy Ghost for conversion of salvation. Now along with this they talk about the Calvinist doctrine, doctrines that they're arguing against and kind of create a straw man that Calvinists believe that God created some men for condemnation um, and and so they're they're kind of setting up a straw man and saying this is what Calvinists believe and making a little bit of a caricature out of it and then saying we reject that so uh, I, I, I read these just to say that I, I'm not claiming that Lutherans and reformed are in complete agreement on these so-called doctrines of grace. They're not and uh, in spite of what you can you know infer when you read um, God chose some and didn't choose others for no reason other than the will of God you could infer from that that yeah they're really right in line with us but there's other places where they say they're not and if you ask a Lutheran you know, you say this, but you say also that. Uh, how do you hold them in, in together? He'll say, I believe this and I believe that. Lutherans have less of a tendency to systematize and organize than, than Presbyterians do. We want to put everything in categories and say, this is what we believe, the Bible teaches that, yeah, we have that. And we have to interpret that in light of this, and we have to make it all fit together somehow. Lutherans aren't quite as worried about that as we are. Isn't that true, Jeff? Yeah, I would say so. That Owens is worried about that. As well. Owens is, is terribly worried about that. He has to get everything exactly right and make it all fit together like a big puzzle and, and explain everything. Lutherans are much more uh, apt to say, Scripture teaches this, we believe that. Scripture also teaches that, we believe that. If they sound like they conflict, we're not 
going to worry about that. I believe this, I believe that. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's kind of their end of it. And so, I, and I don't mean to say that pejoratively, it's just a different approach to, um, you know, Luther was very much, um, he was attacked for saying, you're substituting your interpretation for the interpretation of the church. And, and so he had a tendency to say, this is simply the plain meaning of scripture and, and avoid the idea that I have to interpret this, whereas Presbyterians say, well, we have clear scriptures and less clear and we have to interpret one in light of the other. It's just a, a different approach. So, um, I, I think I'll stop here. I want to talk about, um, we'll talk about the 39 articles and um, I have a story in the Presbyterian Church in Paola. A woman told me that her sister when she found out about what the Presbyterians really believed about predestination and and all of that, couldn't handle that and left left the left the Presbyterian Church and became an Episcopalian. Well, that's that's uh, the the jokes on her because as we'll see next week, we'll talk about the 39 Articles. The Anglicans leave leave uh, no quarter to Presbyterians as far as mm -hmm. a strong view of God's sovereignty. They're every bit as strong as we are on, on their confessional teaching. But we'll look at that next week. <clears throat>